The roar of the symbolic V8 Hemi engine howled over the loud wind rushing through the open windows of my treasured 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. Cool fall air scraped the left side of my head, bringing water to my eyes as it violently blew my long straight bangs away from my face. Taking a hand off the steering wheel, I brushed the hair away from my eyes, silently cursing at myself for putting off the chance to visit my aunt for a haircut. Holding down the accelerator, I quickly looked at the dimly lit speedometer needle sitting triumphantly at 130 miles per hour. Glancing up, the rearview mirror reflected the black road of Route 24, a rapidly retreating plain painted lines and streetlights stretching into the dark night behind me. Returning my focus forward to the barren road illuminated only by my headlights spilling into the rapidly moving tarmac. I am unable to make out the profile of any other cars on the road. It makes sense for this hour. The dash clock read, 3.39 AM. I maintained my gaze of the rearview mirror for a moment longer, eyes straining into the darkness for any signs of other life on the road. The emptiness of the night stares back through the mirror, and my watering eyes begin to see twists and swirls in the darkness, almost as if tendrils were reaching out towards my car. A violent mass of metal and gasoline hurling through the night. Blinking, the swirling dissipated and the road behind me seems to have become more mundane, desolate, empty, safe. I breathed a sigh of relief and I eased my foot from the accelerator, allowing the car to slow down to 85 miles per hour. The average speed of most commuters on this southern Massachusetts roadway. As my heart began to slow, my mind raised, recounting the events that I had experienced earlier within the Freetown State Forest. The evening should have been identical to any other regular outing made to the 5,000 acre section of Government Park just north of Fall River, the city that I currently live in. It was a lazy Sunday afternoon, and so I decided to roll my old Dodge Challenger out from inside the storage space that I make monthly payments towards, just to house it. It may seem like a silly expense at $400 a month just to store an extra vehicle, but the tinkering and rebuilding of this machine with my old man over the years, before he eventually lost his battle with COPD, held many great memories. Keeping it safe was more than worth the money to me. I finished hosing away the foamy soap from the side panels of the vehicle and was admiring the shine of the dirt free green paint when my phone buzzed in my pocket. The message was from my best friend Keegan, asking if I wanted to spend the rest of the afternoon hiking around the Freetown State Forest. He wanted to walk the ledge loop trail and if we had time, Explore some of the other trails that we knew the area had to offer. I shot a quick affirmative reply and tapped over to the conversation with my girlfriend Mackenzie. I quickly typed, You want to join Keegan and me on the hike at the Freetown Forest? A few moments later, Mackenzie replied, No thanks Spencer, you know that place creeps me out. I know she's into shows like Ghost Adventures and has spent hours reading the community ghost stories that seem to trickle out of the Freetown State Forest. You don't live in an area labeled as part of the Bridgewater Triangle, without a few strange stories being told over time I suppose. I smiled and replied, Suit yourself. Don't complain to me when I send you pictures of all the cute fur babies I see walking with their owners. After the immediate, oh, STFU response, I packed up my cleaning supplies and I fired up the Challenger, the loud engine happily purring en route to the trailhead. The next few hours of the afternoon passed like any other day. Keegan and I met in the parking lot, shouldered our hiking packs and spent the time wandering the trails discussing our lives, the future, 
and how we would run the world better than anyone else, if given the chance. We decided to rest at a spot locally known as The Ledge. The peak of an old granite quarry that was used for constructing many of the buildings in the area during the 19th century. One such building being the Taunton State Hospital, built around 1854. It's another supernatural location Mackenzie has pawned spooky stories about. Nowadays, the ledge in the quarry below is largely used as a teenage hangout, a spot for drinking, smoking, graffiti, and the occasional daredevil who has been known to jump into the small pond, 50 or 60 feet below the granite wall. I dropped my bag to the ground and unscrewed the cap of my metal water bottle, putting it to my mouth and taking a long sip of cool water. Keegan was lazily reclined on the ground, his bag still on his back and his fingers clasped behind his head, with his eyes closed into the dimming evening sky. He looked peaceful. His short undercut black hair was filled with product and it had been swept back into a modern style which did match the black goatee that he let grow out on his chin. The way that he held his hands behind his head left his sharp facial features open to the sun. He always seemed to have a mind for fashion, and even while hiking, he was wearing designer clothing. Retrieving the last cliff bar that I had from my bag, I motioned towards the sky while sitting down on a small rock. It looks like it's getting dark pretty early today. We should probably start thinking about heading back to the cars now. Keegan shrugged and replied. Nah, it's fine. And plus I have some flashlights in my bag if it gets too dark. We can use those to find our way back to the cars. Let's hang out here for a bit longer. He reached into his bag and pulled out a worn pack of marble reds. He packed the cigarettes three times into his hand and then pulled one out, placing it into his mouth. Extending his hand, he offered me one. I shook my head. You know I gave those up. I thought you did too. I guess this is why you wanted to stay a little longer, huh? Does Jen know you're back to smoking? He pulled a cheap plastic lighter from his pocket and lit the dust stick in his mouth. Breathing in deeply and then exhaling smoke through his nose, he replied, No, and I would appreciate it if you didn't tell Mackenzie either. He chuckled. Last time she told Jen and I was in a whirl of shit. It was like being grounded in my own house. I shrugged and smiled. Yeah, I remember I had to ask her permission for you to go out with us. You really should quit though. He shrugged and took another drag, slowly exhaling the smoke from his mouth. We continued to talk for a while as the sun descended, until darkness began to fall over the forest. As the light faded into night, we loaded our bags and set off down the trail. Keegan pulled the two flashlights that he had brought out from his bag and we used them to light our way. He walked by my side swishing liquid mouthwash around in his mouth, his solution to hiding the smell of cigarettes from his wife. I laughed heartily when he feebly pulled the bottle of Crest from his bag. Jen probably already knew he was back to smoking. There really is no hiding the smell. The forest canopy exaggerated the evening's darkness, preventing us from seeing much farther than the area illuminated by the flashlights that we held. We walked in a relative silence carefully, moving as to not trip over the undergrowth beneath our feet. As we trudged, I slowly became aware of a strange sound off the trail that seemed to be moving with us, following us. The forest was quiet, devoid of the usual daytime hikers and activity seekers so the sounds of something keeping pace with us off to the side of the trail discomforted me. At first, I figured it was a squirrel jumping around, foraging the forest floor, or possibly a coyote that had wandered too close to the path. But the weight of the footsteps crushing the crisp leaves pushed that thought from my mind. I turned and I swung my flashlight into the darkness, 
catching the wisp of black clothing from a figure quickly ducking behind a tree. Hey, I see you there, I shouted. Keegan turned and pointed his light in the same area. What did you see, dude? He questioned. There's someone out there playing games with us. I replied under my breath. The figure hiding behind the tree had not replied or moved out from their cover and a feeling of my knees began to spread from the pit of my stomach. I whispered. Let's get out of here, man. This dude is freaking me out. Turning, I swung my flashlight back towards the trail in the direction that we had been walking. To reveal three tall figures, all wearing worn hooded cloaks obscuring any features. Somehow, they must have crept up on us while we had looked away. I hadn't heard their movements through the forest at all. How could they have moved so quietly? I heard Keegan shout, What the heck? As something or someone came barreling towards us from the direction that we had been coming from. I had felt a sudden powerful impact in the back of my head, just above my neck and my legs limply crumbled below me, and the world went dark as I fell to the hard ground. A pounding headache greeted me as I returned to consciousness. I groaned. My head felt heavy as my thoughts were groggy and slow. I could feel a lump forming on the back of my head where I had been struck. I moved to touch it and I noticed my hands were bound by rope tied to a small tree behind me. I struggled against the rope, but was unable to break the binds and they painfully dug into my wrists. I could feel panic starting to bubble up, but I forced myself to slowly take a breath to try and calm down. I could almost hear my dad's voice from one of his lectures on survival. Focus. Solve a problem and move to the next problem the solution creates. Looking around as I tried to collect myself, I noticed I was alone with no sight of Keegan. I could hear strange chanting that seemed to dance around in the air. I couldn't decipher the language, but it sounded strangely familiar. The sound originated from a circle of tall humanoid figures, 12 from what I could count, about 30 feet away. All wore long black hooded clothing, similar to the four figures that we had been jumped by in the woods. Outside their circle stood four wooden crosses staked into the ground. The crosses were alight with a fire that glowed and flickered, dimly illuminating the surroundings. I strained again on the rope, once more grimacing as it rubbed the skin of my raw wrist. My thoughts quickened as the throbbing in my head dulled by the spike of adrenaline that had now shot through my body. Stories Mackenzie had told me about the forest came to the forefront of my mind. Wasn't there something that she had said about a group of cultists and a serial killer who had been found dumping bodies in the Freetown forest? A rustle from the dark leaves to my left broke my train of thought. Peering into the dark, my eyes slowly adjusted, and I could make out a crouched humanoid figure. Quiet, I'm gonna try to cut you free. Keegan's voice whispered through the darkness. He carefully stepped out from the brush, and I could feel his hands moving a knife as it began cutting the rope around my hands. What the heck is going on, dude? I grunted quietly under my breath. He whispered into my ear. I have no idea. They took my phone, but I'm glad I always keep a knife in my boots. Now quiet down. Let's get these ropes off and we can get the hell out of here. Keegan grunted in success as the binds holding my hands fell to the forest floor. Rubbing my now raw wrists, I quickly rose to my feet and patted Keegan's shoulder. Thanks. Now let's go, I whispered. I took a step and then froze as the hair on my arms and neck stood up straight. A strange electricity shot through the air. Something was terribly wrong and I could feel it. 
It took a second, but I noticed what my body had picked up on. The low chanting from the group had subsided, replaced by an eerie quiet that had settled on the area. I turned to look at the group. My mind was screaming to run, but for some reason, I was frozen in place. And it appeared the air had the same effect on Keegan standing next to me. For the first time, I noticed a small object placed in the center of the circle. I strained my eyes and I was able to see what appeared to be an ornate jewel-encrusted bowl, filled with a strangely viscous substance that seemed to be swirling around, although there was no wind. The eerie quiet was dispersed by a loud combustion from the artifact as it was enveloped by a large flame that rose from the center and dripping with the strange liquid. It appeared as if a dark, jagged claw-like hand began to emerge from within the flame. I knew I needed to be silent, but the phenomenon caused me to yelp in shock. At my auditory expulsion, the twelve figures in the circle swiveled their heads in tandem to face our direction. One rose its hooded head. A deep, booming voice came forth. The sacrifices have freed themselves. Abaddon is unable to take physical form for long without their blood. His voice shook the strange hold on my body, and using more force than I felt necessary, I turned to Keegan and I shouted, Run! We leapt to our feet, and blindly set off into the looming pines as fast as we could, away from the cultist congregation. Branches and thorny vines battered into me, ripping my clothing as I dead sprinted through the trees. I could hear the sound of them close behind me, crashing through the forest. I found it strange that although they didn't appear to have any flashlights, they seemed to be tracking us easily through the dark. An odd bass reverberation was erupting from deep earth in the forest, bouncing from tree to tree as they continued to chase. I suspected it flowed from the fiery chalice our pursuers left behind. To my left, I could hear Keegan sprinting in time with me as we nimbly maneuvered ourselves over roots and fallen limbs. The forest began to look familiar to me. I knew that all the years that we had spent hiking these trails had allowed us to small advantage as the sounds of pursuit drifted slightly behind us. Vaulting over a fallen log, I finally caught sight of what I had been desperately looking for. A painted trail sign displaying a blue symbol. I was familiar with this marker and I knew that we were close to the parking lot. Yelling Keegan's name to get his attention, we both charged forward in the direction of freedom, pushing our aching, oxygen-deprived muscles for one last burst. As we finally reached the clearing of the parking lot, the sight of my beautiful vehicle, still parked where I had left it, emboldened my spirit. Bursting away from the trail, I deftly leapt over the wooden parking barricade and opened the driver door, sliding into the seat. I panicked for a moment as I felt my keys in my pocket and realized that they were missing. And all the commotion I had not noticed. A spare. I had a spare key, but did I ever remove it from my car? Mackenzie was always on me to not leave a key to my prized ride inside. I gladly praised my irresponsibility as I opened the driver's seat visor and my spare key dropped into my lap. Turning the ignition, the engine loudly whined and then erupted into life, the low rumble echoing into the black forest. I threw the transmission into reverse and I backed out, leaning out the passenger window to yell at Keegan to get into my car. Surely, they had taken his keys as well. What I had failed to notice was that Keegan had tripped on a tree root about three feet from the parking lot's edge. My heart caught in my throat as I noticed him standing to his feet, the front of his clothing covered lightly in a dirt from the forest floor. I shouted through the window, my voice shaking. Hurry up, man! Let's go! He took two steps towards the lot and halted, looking down at his chest, a puzzled expression blooming on his face. Suddenly, 
Blood erupted from his chest, pouring into a puddle on the ground and seeping into his clothing, staining them crimson red. A dark tendril of something scaly and putrid, almost indescribable, pulled itself from the hole in Keegan's chest, and his body dropped lifelessly to the ground. I don't remember screaming, but I know that I did. I could tell that he was dead before his body even hit the ground, and I could see the strange, dark tendril jerk and slide in a crooked, spastic nature as it approached the edge of the parking lot. I slammed the car into drive, tears welling in my eyes, and I shouted with frustration, anger, and sadness. I stopped my foot on the accelerator. The loud squeal of tires accentuated my exit as I drove off into the night. I finally made it back to my house after the short drive down Route 24. I'm not sure what my next step should be. I don't even know if I have a next step to take. I called Mackenzie in hysterics, and she immediately drove over. On the phone, I could tell she couldn't comprehend what I was babbling about, but she knew something was wrong. It's about 4am now as I sit in my living room, staring at the blank TV mounted to the wall. An unopened beer in my hand. Who am I kidding? I can't drink anything right now. All I can see is Keegan's lifeless body falling to the ground. The moment is set and repeat in my mind. Why didn't I do more? Why didn't I get out and at least get his body? What's wrong with me? I can almost feel those haunting tendrils at the edge of my mind as I lose myself in my thoughts. The sound of Mackenzie's car pulling into my driveway breaks me from my deep thought, and the jingle of her keys unlocking the front door raises my spirits. She's here now and she can help me process this. Maybe she'll know what to do. Babe. She calls out as the front door closes. Is everything okay? You sounded so frantic on the phone. I really didn't understand everything you said. But are you okay? You said something's happened to Keegan, but he was waiting for me outside. My mind stopped and my heart skipped a beat. What did she say? Keegan was waiting outside. That's not possible. It can't be. I noticed that I was holding my breath. She turned the corner into my living room, still wearing her sweatpants and loose sweatshirt, that I knew she slept in on cool nights. Her soft red hair was tied into a ponytail, aside from a single strand that drifted in front of her freckled face. She leaned on the doorframe, her arms crossed, biting her nails. Standing behind her was another figure. It was Keegan. It couldn't possibly be, but it was. The wound in his chest that still sat like a terrible photograph in my mind was nowhere to be found. His eyes, usually soft and inviting, are hard and dark, staring daggers at me as if tendrils are reaching out into the light.